just to just walk up. Oh. We're just getting two shots. Well, Mark, some people are just a writer, right? Pardon? Just a writer. I actually look quite like that in my People magazine article. That they followed me along to your interview and you kicked somebody in the teeth? No, I wouldn't do I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Is your girlfriend famous too? It's my wife, and you met her the other night uh, at uh, the, the radio thing okay. they did on Monday night. She's a DJ at NEW. Ah. Her name's Carol Miller. Okay. So they like that chemistry. Okay. Yeah. Carol's Do you like that chemistry? <laughs> Is it Absolutely. Working? Good. Absolutely. Mark, can you just hold the cards in your hand like you would be if you were in the middle of the interview? If they're, I mean, wherever you're going to hold them. So if I need I don't know another where I'm shot. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that, okay. that I'm going to be putting them like Do this. I don't know how much I'm going to look at them, really. Okay. Then we have I'm going to give up smoking. It's like those films that they show, the car crash films that they show you. I don't know if they do that in England, but after you get a certain amount looking forward to going home to England and going to the lavatory. We're ready whenever you guys are wrong. It's got strange toilet paper over there. <laughs> the last interview, just keep that in your mind as we speak. This is the this is it. You're home free. And we'll start with a question about something that probably you haven't discussed much. Uh, what were the beginnings of the White City project? Uh well, the, the, the beginning of the actual idea, where I got the idea from, I was, uh, I was driving home. You know, I used to drive home from this place where I, I do book publishing, which is in Bloomsbury in London, and I used to come back and hit this big traffic jam. And in Shepherd's Bush, which is where I grew up and where the Who began, there's this housing project called White City. And I used to tuck back through this place that I knew so well and go through all the back streets and skip the jam, you know. And I did that for about, I don't know, six weeks or something. And around that same time I was thinking about uh, a, a something I could hang this story on that I wanted to be about, I wanted the story to be about the decline of the British Empire uh, and how it was affecting people, post, people, uh, post war kids and, and, and families and uh, one day I'm driving through and I look around a little bit and I, I suddenly realize that this place, well, this white city housing project has got all these crazy street names connected to the British Empire like New Zealand Road, Australia Road, Canada Way, Blancfontein Road which is a place in South Africa. They've even got a South Africa fish shop, you know a fish and chip shop called the South Africa Fish Bar. And, uh, so a couple of days later I went back early in the morning and I drove around and looked at the place. I took a little camera crew on another occasion then I started to talk to people and the place really kind of struck me. You know, it felt like this was where I could set this idea. And uh, I remember the f well, first morning I went there on my own at about 5.30 or something in the morning and the sun started to come up and in the distance there's this guy with a big grey beard and big grey hair and, and he had, had no shirt on, looked like a tramp walking in the street. And I thought, hey, I've got no money on me, I know this guy's going to touch me. And he got closer and closer and closer and every kind of, I went on this side of the pavement, he went on that side of the pavement, so on and so forth. And uh, he came up and he, he talked to me. But what he said was, he said, hello Pete, I, I used to come and see you at the Goldhawk. This was somebody that looked about 80 years old. <laughs> and he's a guy that used to come and see the Who play. And uh, I suppose that just indicates how old I am. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then he asked you for five. Uh, yeah, then he asked me for five. <laughs> no, I, I saw him on and off during the period that we were filming there and stuff. That's where the idea grew. It was just kind of things coming together, strings coming together. What is it about White City aside from the roads? in the streets that, that made you think that this was the right setting for the story that you wanted to tell? Because it's completely and totally self-contained. You know, it's, it was a housing project built in the 30s for, for, for both blue-collar workers and for immigrants, for Irish immigrants and Caribbeans. And it has schools, you know, like Catholic schools, Protestant schools, churches of every denomination you know, a few sh shopping mall and, and, and about 
35,000 apartments in blocks. But it's very, very clearly cut off. On one side, there used to be a big dog track, racing track. The other side, there's a big freeway, the one I turned off. The other side, there's Shepherd's Bush itself and the market and the main street. And on the other end, there's a great big swimming pool. And so it's very, very contained, you know? In the beginning of the, of the cassette, of the, the feature, there's these images that look like, you, you say fortress, and I thought prison. Well... Barbed wire and... Yeah, yeah. High walls. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, there's something about... There's, there's, a, there's a point there I was trying to make to the fact that, you know, that these places do look like prisons from the outside. You know, the film, the way the film begins is not the way the film ends. You know, you you drive through a pretty tough neighborhood and they often, it does look pretty bad from the outside, this place, because the, the uh, all the ground floor buildings, all the street level buildings are, are boarded up, you know, at night the shops, they put wire shutters up at the windows. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when the kids come out to go to school, the place is magic, you know, so. Uh, but it is a prison. And the places, the, the rooms that people live in are like cells. And they're small and they're uncomfortable. But they're, you know, they're, they're home to these people and every one of them has got a window and out of every window you can see the stars. And uh, I remember a guy who was in prison actually in South Africa telling me that the most important thing was that it didn't matter where he was. He didn't like being moved around. You know, once he got his cell, he didn't like being moved to another cell. But the most important thing was is that he had to have a cell where he could see the sky. And that was really, really important. And it struck me. Yeah. Did the LP, the music on the LP and the feature, developed together independently what's the connection between no them? i was absolutely determined to make sure that they they developed at the same time what excites me about conceptual music video or even non-conceptual music video you know even just music video music video long things of whatever is going to happen in the future uh thing that excited me about it most is that was, was the idea of being able to create an atmosphere, like a backdrop, a, a setting against which songs would be heard. You know, people would buy a record and they would be able to have seen a film which would give them a tremendous amount of detail, flavour, visual detail about where I was writing about, the kind of people I was writing about, and that would actually you know, I, I've been living in Britain all my life, selling songs to Americans, many of whom would never ever even travel to London, where I was brought up. This is a kind of opportunity to redress that balance, you know, to show in great detail, not just, you know, not just the Houses of Parliament and a double-decker bus and a policeman with a funny-shaped hat, you know, but uh, some of the details, you know, of, of, of how it was. And, that it was very important to me that the two things happened at the same time. So I didn't start to write the film script until I had the story. And I didn't try and write any songs until I had the story. So then the two things grew like that. And uh, right up until the end, we were changing things in the music and changing things in the film. The two evolved at the same speed. It's very important, I think. And one of the few times that it's happened, I can think Ray Davies has done something in a way similar, but not quite exactly what, what you've done here. No, no, no. Is it, is it Purple Rain is close, because Purple Rain, although that was a feature length thing, uh, was a, a real groundbreaker, I think. I, I tell you why. Uh, it, the way he used music, the way he used his songs, helped the story, and the story helped the music. But they didn't really illustrate one another. Uh, in Tommy, for example, there were a lot of places where the songs were very clear what they were about. You know, the Cousin Kevin or Uncle Ernie or the Pinball Wizard. You know, the songs told you the story, the songs gave you the imagery. So when you saw the movie, the movie was actually just adding a new look at that colour. And that's where you get this objection from people who say, I don't like video that illustrates so, a song which I've already got a vision for. Mm. Well, 
I think that music video of the kind that you see in White City... I'm so Richard got really fuzzy, you can tell. It, it's not going to be usable. So, so from, from where should we start when we come back? It started. Um, you actually asked, and I'd love you to rephrase it, his answer started, Purple Rain, that was the thing. So mm -hmm. you, you had said, actually, Ray Davies did something similar. You might want to say whatever, you know. Okay. Was there anything? So Let me just hit on this. Are they beaties? What do yeah. you call them? Beaties? Yeah. I haven't seen one of those suckers. Where did you see them first? I saw them in, I'm from Philadelphia and they used to sell them in the hippie district. Did they really? Yeah. Because they, uh, they would stop with them coming in for a long time, I thought. Okay. Oh, okay. I commented that Ray Davies seems to have done something similar to what you've just done, but not exactly based on... Yeah, the return to Waterloo. I think uh, uh, the real groundbreaker in this area was uh, Purple Rain. What was interesting about Purple Rain was is that Prince told a story in the film, although it was feature length, it was long, uh, and, he told mu and he sang songs, but the songs didn't try to illustrate the film and the film didn't illustrate the songs. They coexisted, they worked together and there was poetry kind of created in between, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, very distinct from what happens, say, in a film like Tommy, where if you take a cameo scene like Pinball Wizard, it's very clear what's happening. There's a deaf, dumb and blind kid playing pinball. What you see in the film is you see, hey, a deaf, dumb and blind kid playing pinball. You know, you already know that. And people object quite a lot, don't they? They say one of the things about rock videos that I don't like is, is that it interferes with my ability to visualise the music. Well, good music video should add to your ability to visualise the music. It should draw you in. I mean, if you take something like, I'm going to have to use an example which isn't even connected with music, but we get Hill Street Blues in Britain, which is a great script and great characters and everything. When that's finished, it kind of continues with me. You know, it continues. I, I carry a lot of the imagery in, uh, of Hill Street Blues around with me. You know, it's like, I know it's not real New York and it's not real cops, but there's something about the whole program which is slightly poetic. And I think, you know, in movies we've seen it done for centuries, you know, this idea that certain films have a poetic quality. The word I often come back to is poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's not images we're after, it's poetry. You know, because what we see in our head when we hear music isn't a little TV screen with things happening on it. We see something much bigger than that. So we should look at what happens on the TV screen rather than saying, hey, that's replacing these things I see in my head. Somebody should look at it as a catalyst. I love that Cheech and Chong thing, you know, that... <laughs> people say to me, how does it feel working in book publishing and, uh, uh, you know, don't you think it's, you know, when you've sell all these records and you can reach all these people? And I think, you know, the, the idea of somebody reading a book, hey, look, that guy's reading a book. Isn't that quaint, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Records are going to be like that one day. There's going to be the guy, you know, cheating, hey, uh, getting stoned here, this is great. You know, I can put the stereo up and hear all these sounds and see things, you know. Hey, look at that guy listening to a record, look. Isn't that quaint? Because <laughs> it's a potential art form. I think. The idea that you want these, these spaces filled in and that you want to leave the gaps to have people fill in their own sorts of, of images, is that why what wound up in the feature musically is not altogether the same as what wound up on the LP? That's because we're in a period of transition right now. You know, I, uh, I hope that future projects that I do will be just issued on video uh, and would have a soundtrack album. Uh, this is a bit different, you know. The, 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 the machinery is out there, the VCRs are out there, the medium is there, but, you know, the form isn't quite complete. So I, I'm making a record and making a film at the same time, knowing that it's a, sm it's a kind of, we haven't quite arrived yet. You said something pretty important here, I think. The future projects, you hope to have a soundtrack album, but the feature is really what's going to be the, uh, the heart of it, am I right? Mm-hmm. And the feature will be what you're making. 
as opposed to the album. And the music that applies to it, yeah, I think it would still have the same kind of writing basis. I think I would still write it as music and consider the visual images as part of the whole process. Uh, after 25 years in the rock business, the 20 years of that with a who, uh, one of the things that I that I now feel is, is that not that that not necessarily that rock music as a form has burned itself out or anything like that, but that that for me, I'm one of one of the maybe ten or twenty people in this industry, not only who un, who have enough, enough understanding of both mediums in order to try things and experiment, we're the only people they'll give the money to. So we have to do it. It's our responsibility. I think. <laughs> Noblesse oblige. <laughs> Why did you choose uh, Richard Lowenstein as a director? How did you come to meet him? And I saw a film, I had a screening of Purple Rain uh, in a viewing theatre in London. And in the same day, I had a screening of his feature, which was shot on Super 16, that's a small format, blown up to 35 mil, called Strike Bound. Now, he's a director, he's 24 years old, he's Australian. He has a buddy from film school, who's his lighting cameraman, Andrew DeGroote. And he's famous for making videos of Australian bands, particularly in excess. That guy with a haircut a bit like yours, you know, curly at the back. And, uh, they're very big there, and I hope they'll, uh, they'll do well here. Uh, anyway, I thought, here's a guy who knows about rock promo, but also has made a feature that I like, and he's young. And uh, he won't have too many preconceptions and won't be... He's not running from film, and he's not leaning on video. You know, he's, it, there was an open door there. And we met, and we got on, and he helped me. He adapted the story that I had to a script. He made it into a little bit more of a film film than I at first wanted. But he was very important to me in explaining to me that how, what he felt, you know, this thing about it, that we were in a period of transition, you know. If we made a music video right now, a pure music video, uh, it might just end up happening too soon. And that's hurt me before, you know. I don't want to do that again. I mean, Quadrophenia was a wee bit ahead of its time. It hardly sold any records in the USA. And yet now, retrospectively, everybody acknowledge acknowledges it as a great piece of work. Uh, it's happened to me before, and I don't want it to happen again. I want to be, you know, tomorrow is tomorrow, and I'm interested in now, and the audience that's available now. Do you wish they would have been around for the film, Lowenstein, for Quadrophenia? Lowenstein. Yeah. I wish I'd had the. He he was about six years old then. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish we'd have been able to make the movie when we were making the record. But uh, you know, God, it's hard work making a good record anyway. So the amount of extra effort that's involved in the extra coordination and the amount of time and that you take on when you start to make a film as well. It's enormous. You know, I've been working for a year solid on this one project and you end up with a little film and a little record, you know, and maybe three months of exposure if you're lucky. And then it's back to the grindstone again. And, and a lot of artists come under pressure when they try and produce one album a year. Uh, in the past, I've only ever managed one album about every two and a half years. I once entered into a record deal for my solo career with Atlantic. This is in 79. I signed a deal for th three albums, one every year. At the same time, I was feeling a little bit bad about the fact that people might think that my solo career was affecting The Who. So I signed another deal with The Who to produce five albums over three years with The Who. <laughs> <laughs> those, those same so years, was, of course. Yeah, so that's eight albums <laughs> over three years from somebody who uh, had only actually been able to manage an album every two and a half years. <laughs> and so, so at this rate, I'll be produced, uh, you know, if I'm 40 now, I've got another 20 working years. You're going to get like two albums out of me. <laughs> <laughs> the feature? Yeah, Great. 
Well, I think what's interesting, I, I don't think it's really the kind of thing you can talk about on MTV, but what's interesting is the moment where MTV is uh, a window for promos to sell records. That's what it is, in, uh, apart from the fact that it is changing the way that new artists are. It's one day a gallery which will be uh, introducing music videos. And then how much better it is because you you know that the video side of it is going to be really integrated with the music instead of just added on in a lot of cases by hicks from you know shampoo commercials and and uh, people who can't get enough dough to make their feature film. What exactly was your involvement in in the development of this feature? You wrote obviously you wrote the story, but. How about the screenplay? And I wrote the screenplay too. I wrote three or four versions of the screenplay. I've written many screenplays in my time. This is the first one that's actually been realized. And when Richard first came over, uh, he adapted it. He went through it with me and he, he changed bits that he knew as a, a filmmaker he could work, he, he couldn't do, that we couldn't do things we couldn't do. Things that would be too expensive to do, and things that maybe wouldn't work artistically either. He was very good. He was very faithful to what I wanted. In actual fact, you know, I, I, the idea that you know, because he was so young, I would be able to maybe on occasion, you know, just win arguments just by seniority, turned out not to be the case. You know, this guy's tough. <laughs> He won all the arguments. So this must be the director who was uh, too young to have forgotten who you were. That's the guy, yeah. <laughs> Screenplay, uh, your concept, and beyond that, in terms of real nuts and bolts kind of things. Well, I, I, I've gone a, a, quite a long way into uh, understanding film. Uh, I, and also its use as an element in writing. I have personally been involved and at one stage edited a, a, an hour-long documentary. I've made lots of films, I've been involved in a hell of a lot of films and in production of films and in the work of what we in Britain call video artists. I sponsor video artists and I'm working on a project uh, to uh, bring the work of a number of a fairly avant-garde video artist together in an album package, like a, which might come out every three months, that kind of thing. That seems to me very much a, an extension of the kind of work that I do in book publishing. And, uh, and I run a video studio with an editing suite in the building with, right in the suite that where my uh, control room is, where I make the music. So if I'm for example, on parts of the atmosphere footage, incidental music you call it, for the film, you know, I was able to run raw footage in the studio while I was writing the music and even playing the music, so the atmospheres were very, very linked. And there again, there were moments later in the day where, where Richard wanted the chemistry to be slightly different, and there was a lot of give and take there. But the process is one which I, I have immersed myself in and I'm very familiar with. So I was able to allow, I hope, allow Richard Lowenstein a tremendous amount of scope, knowing that I had already, had already got a feeling of where it was I wanted to go. You know, in other words, you know, you're, you, there are several routes that you can take to get someplace. And I just knew that the place that I wanted to get, we would arrive at, and I didn't mind if we took a slightly different route to get there. Mm. You, you've mentioned a couple of times here today and at other times about uh, sort of blending of, of mediums in a way. Uh, you call White City, the LP, a novel. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 I got away, yeah, it's a bit of a gag, really. I, I, I got away with rock opera, you see, so I thought... Because, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people like hearing this stuff, you know, they're going to be saying, you know, pretentious, you know, the same old thing, Townsend hasn't changed, pretentious. All this stuff, rock and roll, art, who cares, you know, just as long as it 
makes me dance. And that's an important part of the music, it always has been. You know, it's entertainment first, I accept that. But it's all, all, also been a lot, lot bigger for a lot of people. And uh, will continue to grow. And uh, I've always said, ever since I was a, a snotty 19-year-old kid with, you know, with my first record contract, rock and roll is art. That's what I said then, and that's what I believe now. You know, because there's a New York painter called Rauschenberg who painted a big picture, and its purpose was to drive people out of the art gallery back onto the street where the art really was. Well, rock and roll's got always had a kind of a a quality of that about it. You know, like it's 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 art, but it's a you know it's art. I, I think. Well, I'm probably preaching to the converted here. We, I think everyone know, knows what I'm saying. But the, the uh, drawing the mediums together, uh, what's interesting about that is that you start to realise, I've started to realise that there's a, there's a, there's a, a unique chemistry involved it we all know understand the chemistry involved in the rock song it's simple it's straightforward you know you 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 have a, a fairly uh clear shape for a rock song you know verse chorus verse chorus middle eight verse chorus fade mm -hmm. you know and if you can make it happen in that particular time if you can make people dance if you can catch their attention and hold it great and if then on top of that the record can maybe go a little bit deeper then fine you know uh, if it can do that and uplift at the same time then that's wonderful and all I feel right now is is that that particular form the rock song will always remain you know songwriters will always be greatly attracted to it uh, but what I enjoyed about White City was the fact that uh, I had a chance to extend certain things and change viewpoints. So, as you say, you know, y y you look at the record cover and you see some notes. That's one way of seeing, you know, like different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. You can hear a song, you can see it, and it's, it's very rich. I think the, the idea, though, that you're crossing lines, uh, artistic lines and, uh, and mediums. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to do features, you're still obviously doing music. You're publishing and you're writing and it seems, for example, Horse's Neck is to me like a record. It's not a, it's not a novel. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of songs to me. Mm -hmm. Does it, did, it, did you start off to, to do it that way? Does it feel that way to you? Or? It's, it's, I'm very pleased you said that because I mean one of the things I thought is that who is going to buy this record and I thought well obviously the first batch of books are going to go out to people who are, like, who, who are interested in the way I write songs so I thought I'll try and keep things fairly short you know short and tight and concise not necessarily in a, in a reductive sense not a patronizing sense not because I don't think that people that like rock and roll can't sit down with a novel I know they do but you know just that this is what they might feel most comfortable with from me. And, and also, I suppose it was a book that I wanted people to read several times in their life, you know, maybe two or three times. And uh, as a result, I did adopt that form. If I ever write again, I'll probably write a novel. Because uh, the, the other thing was, is I wasn't really confident that people would be able to forget that it was me that was writing the book, you know. And uh, maybe all that suggests is, is that I wasn't confident enough as a writer. But as for, I mean, somebody said to me the other day, don't you think, uh, don't you get a lot of flack from people who say, listen, you, who are you, this sort of, you know, rock, rock star who used to break up hotel rooms and guitars and, and uh, ended up a junkie you know, working for a book publishing company, writing literature and talking about, you know, uh, what do they know? <laughs> you know, because this is the trouble, this is the, the elite, the elite in this world, you know, become the elite by sticking their noses in the air and wandering around 
try to pretend that we don't live in a garbage can. We know we live in a garbage can, you know. And for a while I opened my mouth and a bit of garbage went in. Now I know to keep it shut, you know. Open the lid and occasionally look out, you know. It's a garbage can, you know. I love it here. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, I, I think one of the things about, about, about modern, you know, contemporary art created in cities for people that live in cities, cities that seem to just grow and grow and grow, even to the point where, where they, you know, th th this is something that one of the things that we have to come to terms with is the way that we hurt ourselves and the way that we hurt other people without ever even meaning to, you know, a sense of, 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 of <clears throat> and there's a kind of a blink of blindness that, 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 that we have. And so what our music does and what our painting does and what our television does and what all the other uh, social art forms do, I think, is they just give us a chance to look out and then back in again, you know, like a, like a, uh, to, to share things. Right. You know, that, that idea that I mentioned earlier, uh, or I mentioned before, talking to you, the thing about the being in a, in a little room, an apartment block, and having a window and looking out, and the most important thing is it doesn't matter how small your room is, just as long as you can have a window that sees the stars, every room has now got two windows. <laughs> One you can see the stars and the other is a little bit smaller with 525 lines and through it you can hear about the tropical rainforest being cut down at 5,000 acres a day. You can hear about some lunatic machine gunning people from the top of a tower block. You can hear about the fact that the Chinese are selling heavy water to Argentina and the Ayatollah Khomeini and you cannot do anything about it. It's out of your control. So, you know, occasion, you know, occasionally it would be nice if something came out of that box, which was similar to the stars. You God, know. do you love television? Yeah. I can just tell. I don't know whether I love television. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's got a tremendous amount of potential. No, I think one of the things, one of the things that's interesting to think about is the power of modern uh, uh, journalism in television, the power of it, because it's got images with it, you know, it's shocking, it's so effective. Uh, okay, you know, in newspapers you get a lot more detail and stuff, but you know, the, the, it really draws you in. It doesn't surprise me that right now a lot of pop music is uh, becoming slightly more like entertainment, because if you're a kid in school and you're hearing all this stuff about all these terrible things that are happening out there, you want your music to be music. You want it to be slightly more entertainment. Never forget that the 60s, when rock and roll needed to be challenging, needed to be violent, needed to be rough, needed to be earthy, needed to handle issues, and needed to sort of keep our heads down into, you know, they were easy times. They were easy times, really they were. And uh, it's a bit different now. Times are tougher and I think, uh, I think it's not, not by coincidence that it was this year that Live Aid happened, started by some guy from the punk movement, you know, not from my era. I wasn't, I wish I'd have had the idea, you know, Geldof did it. And uh, that, in a sense, brought lots of artists from different eras together, people who perhaps, like myself, once, you know, wanted everything they did to carry a message, and say, an artist like Madonna, who could have built her career in a whole different way. Uh, and a lot of people would say, well, you know, she's just a performer, you know, she doesn't say anything. But what we both did at that concert, thanks to Bob Geldof, me and Madonna were very close, what we both did, <laughs> what we both did is we did something, you know. <coughs> You've touched on so many different things. Well, you, you talked about the idea that uh, light times demand heavy mu music and, uh, and vice versa. That's, that's traditionally been the case. The 30s here was a horrible time financially. There was no money. It was the, the Depression. And yet some of the greatest jazz and swing and funny, fun music happened yeah, around that yeah, time. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly now times are tough again. Yeah, so I think the music will, get, will be more fun, lighter. One of the things that, that I like about all the things that you do is that consistently you like looking back. You seem to want to just 
sort of maybe look forward, but you just have your hand reaching back every so often to just touch places or things that, that you've been. What is it about that process that is important to you? I rem I, it, the um, American Constitution, you know, the elements of, of the American Constitution were put together with three other elements. You know, they, the guys that did it read the Bible, they read the Magna Carta, and they read something else. I can't remember what it was. Uh, they were historians, you know, they were quite young men. Their average age was about 40. And they put together what is acknowledged by most politicians to be one of the most cohesive and intellectually produced constitutions in the world because it's based on power being vested in people. And yet, it was good because it was made by men who understood history and the mistakes of history. So I keep an arm, as you say, back on what's happened because I think what has happened is, is so vitally important as to what will happen. But you know, I damn trying to live in the present. I saw a thing about the New York Folk Festival the other day, my friend uh, Ted Geyer runs it, and uh, there was a thing with Donovan in there, one of the many, many artists, including Pete Siegel and lots of other folk artists, and Donovan says, I am very much a person of the 80s. <laughs> and uh, I thought, God, yeah, you and me both, Donovan, very much persons of the 80s. You know, it's hard to keep on the case, and you, uh, one good way for somebody that's been around for 20 years to see where they fit into today is to constantly reappraise and acknowledge what they've already done and what other people have already done. Because what, what my function is today as an artist isn't just what I do today, but also what I have to be aware of the effect of what I've already done. I can't walk away from it. It's there, you know, it's remembered. And, uh, you know, there's a lot attached to it. You know, you ref when you talk about yourself and you say, I'm 40, you, you jokingly say, um, I'm 40, I'm old, I'm whew, 25 years in the rock business, and yet the guys who put the Constitution together were young men at 40, you said. Well, for Just politicians, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> one of them was 80. But, but a rock one star them, at 40. One of them was 80 and one of them was 27. But I, I, uh... <laughs> no, I mean, I, my, my, my semantics are very much rooted in, in, in the, uh, in the rock ethos, you know. I, I also feel that there is a predominantly young market still for pop music. Uh, people of my age don't buy as many albums. Hell, I don't. Uh, my kids buy many more records than I do. Uh, and I'm quite happy with that. I let them go out and buy them, you know what I mean? I used to buy, when I was on the road, I used to buy records. I used to go down to some record store and, and maybe buy two or three hundred records and just hope that I'd bought some of the ones that I'd really wanted. But I'm too lazy to dedicate myself to going out on a particular day and buying that record that I heard on the radio. You know, I'm too busy, you know, I've got too many other important things to do. So obviously music's value has reduced, you know, as a consumer, I mean, to me, somewhat. <clears throat> and I did a concert in Brixton the other day, a solo thing. Dave Gilmore and I from Floyd did a concert and we put a big band together. And uh, good fun, it was a lot of fun doing it. But the audience was so young, you know, maybe, maybe in their 20s, early 20s. Does and it bother you that, that you've just by default ceased to make music for your contemporaries? You started off 25 years? To some extent, years. yeah, to some extent, yeah, because I really feel I've, I, I can talk to them really you know, I don't know, maybe a, may, may, maybe a lot of those people uh, listen to what I say and think, listen, Pete, we know all that, you know, it's good that you're telling these kids this, but, you know, that's not really the way I feel. I feel I've, uh, I've hit on a few goodies every now and again, you know, particularly <laughs> musically, you know, I just think this is something that I want. I mean, it's great to be uh, an established musician and still have a young audience, there's no question about it. Uh, but I, I, 
when I was 19, uh, old enough to, to fight in Vietnam, when I was 19, I God, the guy, one guy, a security guy that's working for me right here, was in Vietnam when he was 17. You know, that's the age of my daughter, who I still think of as a baby, you know, it's horrifying. Anyway, uh, when I was 19, I, <clears throat> I wouldn't trust the advice of anybody over 30. Uh, but now, you see, I think I know why. <clears throat> because those people over 30 were from another world. They were from a world where you had to fight to prove yourself. You had to be prepared to go and, you know, and you had to do what you were told. You had to fight when you were told, be told to fight. And all those values to me seemed to be wrong. Uh, and it was only people that were slightly younger who had fought maybe in the last war and, and had seen a lot of stuff that they didn't like who felt that, that, that you know, who I sort of halfway trusted. Uh, but I think, you know, we've been so long now without, without that kind of, those kind of values being hung in front of us. That's what, another thing I really wanted to get to grips with in White City, the fact that a lot of the younger people there, they're not about to, to even try and s attempt to, to follow those older values. You know, they're not going to be fooled by those old values. They're not going to go and... Uh, pursue the success principle. There are a lot of women that live there <coughs> who just aren't going to get married because mother wants them to get married. They're just not going to do it because they know that their old man doesn't work. He's got no job. He's got no future. He can give her a baby, but he can't give her anything else except black eyes and a smashed up bedroom. You know, that's the state of the nation, you know. And so that's changed, you know, and a lot of other things are changing. And, uh, and you can't argue with that. And if I, as an older person, say, hey, listen, marriage is wonderful. You know, you should do it. It is for me now. Do you mean the new boss isn't the same as the old boss? Can you stop for a second? Probably not. <laughs> Is a more, it gives a fairly effective distinction between me and, and Jim in the film. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did growing up in a post-war England affect Pete Townsend? And everybody else, I think. Uh, well, I was going to ask you if it affected everyone else differently. Uh, no, I think I think I think you know that the the, uh, the 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 young British male has always been encouraged to when he wanted adventure and excitement go to sea. You know, go to sea. This is a small island. There's no room for adventurers here. And uh, although I renounced all the old values, although I renounced. You know, I was a real peace Nick, you know, and a real, you know, all that stuff. I was one of the first members of the CND movement, and I was a bit of a lefty and used to read Karl Marx, and I was against money and against family, and I, I, I remember once saying something that uh, my generation is not only anti-establishment, but it's anti-young marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and yet, what was the first thing I did? You know, I got in a rock band, went to sea, was extremely violent, <laughs> came home, got married. Nobody gave me a medal. That's when the penny dropped. They said, listen, you piece of shit, go back where you came from. I said, hold on, I was just doing, you know, I was just following the book of rules. You know, that's what we do, isn't it? You know, ah, but you only do it when you're told to do it and you only do it the way we tell you to do it. In other words, you go with a gun and you come back with a slave. That's the way it's done, you know, you <laughs> don't. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yet still I felt a bit dirtied, you know, I thought, hold on a minute, you know, I've been, you know, I've been brought up to do this, you know what I mean? It's in my blood. And I think maybe young people today, 
maybe they're not brought up that way because their parents who have been brought up like me because I my kids are teenagers the kind of age group that probably watch MTV all the time if we had it in Britain they'd have it on all the time I'm sure they uh, they hear me saying these things they say you know like saying listen don't listen to that stuff it's it's archaic it's gone and it will never be that way again and uh, and look what it did to me, you know, <laughs> a living proof that it doesn't work. There's one of my favorite film directors, Sam Peckinpah, is a firm, was a firm believer <coughs> that, her, that manhood was, def was defined by acts of heroism slash violence. Yeah. It was a must. Is that not the case? No, I think he's absolutely right. And, uh... As far as manhood is concerned, that is an old value. Manhood is an old value. That's what is going, you know. Who wants, who wants manhood, you know? I don't. Then define manhood for me. What do you mean that, that, that that's going? No, this is the problem, you see. They're just like values attached to values, you know, the idea that there's a... a, a, a uh, the, the actual acts, the act of heroism, success, money, uh, you know, your, your willingness to sacrifice everything in order to get those, and all those things, and society and the family's complicity in allowing men to go through that. Why do I have to prove I'm a man? You know, I am a man. I am a man, you know. That's it. It just so happened that the genes went that way and, and I turned out to be sort of three quarters man and one quarter something else. You know, I, I can't control it, you know. Nobody that calls me any, any different is going to make any difference about what, the way I am. You know, I am what I am. I am what I am and I live in a garbage can. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's just so much bullshit, that stuff. And... Uh, but then Sam Peck Peckinpah is older than me and comes from another generation, and he's stuck with that. But nonetheless, and I don't want to get off on a whole Peckinpah kind of a tangent, the, the attitude is, though, and, and you lived it yourself. You said, I went out and I, and I was violent and I was heroic, and, I, and you got a medal on the cover of the album. You're wearing a damn medal. Yeah, I gave it to me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gave myself a medal. I thought, well, it's about time here. I gave myself a gong. It was, it, it was <laughs> like, well, there was no war for you to, to participate in, so you went off and fought the rock wars. The Who did a song called I've Known No War. I remember Dave Marsh, the rock critic, saying that this is just, you know, bullshit. You know, that, you know sure there was war. There was the Vietnam War, there was this war, there was that war, but I've never been involved in any war. Uh, and I suppose I had to, uh... No, I suppose what, what I'm actually saying is how I felt, I feel now looking back that I was going through the motions, you know, and there were so many things that I did, and when people said, you know, why do you feel the need to be so threatening? You know, why do you have to scare people? Why does your music have to be rebellious and violent? Why? <clears throat> and so, so much, so much about the American music audience. When we first started in Britain, and there's a number of different ways I can say this, so bear with me. The English music audience, in the first two years of our career, 65, 66, we introduced ourselves with guitar smashing, Union Jack jackets, pop art, we were connected with the mod movement. Uh, I used to say just as many crazy things as I'm saying now. You know, we had big mouths, we were, we were ugly, we were violent, we, you know. But we were stylists, you know. And when we came to America, the strange thing was, this is in 67, the Americans said, oh, isn't this cute? You know, they're stylists, you know. They smash the guitars, isn't this funny? Yeah, hey, hey, keep that away from me. That's a nice jacket. Uh, <laughs> can you, uh, can you play? You know, and we say, can we play? Yeah, yeah, we can play too. And they said, well, let's hear you play. They listened to us play. We went from playing 20-minute sets to playing two-hour sets in a period of one month because people were listening to the music. <clears throat> uh, 
And interestingly enough, I think if the Who had come over to this country with none of those things, eventually people would, but by listening, have listened to us and uh, <coughs> those little fun things that we used to do, like trash hotel rooms, <laughs> uh, just wouldn't have happened, you know. But I don't think we would have been any less important. It might have just taken us, we might have just taken a different route and <coughs> because the threat that we required to present was actually contained in the music. The threat itself, the, the violence, the threat of violence was contained in the music. It's like the idea that, you know, in order to be taken seriously as young man, men, we didn't have to carry out acts of violence. We just had to say, listen, we could be just as violent as you folks used to be. We could go and kill Germans if we wanted to. We could drop atom bombs on Japan. We could do all that stuff. You know, don't think we couldn't, you know. But we won't. We won't. Mm -hmm ever and you have to say it and mean it but at the same time you know if all they understand is violence you have to be able to be prepared to threaten it uh, but at the last analysis uh, it's very difficult for young for young people that live in a uh, must be very difficult for, for, for women who are traditionally must much less attached to all those ideas of violence and you know that it's not kind of not not the way that they prove themselves using Sam Peckinpah's uh, terms of references but at the same time you know a lot of women are driven to to using violence in order to protect themselves against violence you know and there's always that thing you know I'm not I haven't got my head in a cloud you know if somebody comes along and threatens me with violence it's you know I have to make a choice Did you know somebody like the character Jim? Oh yeah, a lot of people, yeah. Jim in White City was meant to be a kind of carry-on from uh, Jimmy in Quadrophenia. Somebody, you know, a little bit further on, to see what happened to him further on. What, what, what's the difference between Jim and Pete? Except a couple of years. I ran away, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to see. I, I'm starting to feel a little bit nervous about, about this right now because I don't know whether this is true of everybody that lives on the White City Housing Project. Of course it can't be, it's absurd to generalise, but the thing that did strike me when I went back there to look around was that they didn't seem to be running away, you know, they were they were just staying they would they you know where, where i talked about i've talked about how a lot of the women that live on the estate are single parent families we call them in britain they've miraculously somehow had babies uh let's find out how it's done and they they they're living on their own in this you know it's about a third of the people that live on the White City Housing Project are, are single mothers with kids. And, uh, and yet their fathers of the kids were often close by, often lived on the estate. And it's, it's not, I'm not saying that's a good thing, because it's not a good thing, but it's better that at least they're still close. It's better that at least they still are going to come across one another in the street. It's better that at least that the 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 the, uh, the, the, the kid is going to going to see, see his father or his kids or her father every now and again, uh, rather than just what happens in the rest of society, where you know every one in three marriages ends up in divorce and in a hell of a lot of cases recriminations and anger and bitterness and festering bitterness uh, where fathers just never get to see their children or so rarely you know and they live on other so every you know somebody runs away and I just felt the same thing applied also to the way that the people, the different ethnic groups in the community got along. You know, they're really, it's quite a small place. They're all really all crammed in together. The Irish community, which still has all its individuality and the way that they do things. You know, the men are all traditionally very heavy drinkers and do manual labour when they can get it. 
and usually Catholic families, and the, the Caribbeans are, 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 are slow and easy, and uh, and you know the younger the younger ones. You, uh, a lot of the younger kids in the neighbourhoods, you know, to make a little bit of money on the on on, on the side, with with uh, ganja to the Rastafarians and that kind of thing. The 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 gypsies just steal from everybody. There's about ten percent gypsies. You know, from everybody. Every, everything that's here is ours. You know, uh, uh, and the 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 English community there just go on in the same old stolid British way, going and drawing their dull money and sort of, you know. The worst thing they do is pretend that that that, that in some way that they're, that they're better than everybody else, you know. And yet they're all together in the same community and they get on, you know. Uh, I thought about this word apartheid, this word that is, was invented by the Dutch to describe the situation in South Africa where ethnic groups live apart, but most important, they cannot even make love. Uh, in White City, whatever you think of your neighbours, if you feel like it, one night, you know, you can make love. And that's really nature's way, not only of improving the race and everything else, but of just breaking down a lot of immutable barriers. And the, the, the thing that I was so struck by was that, you know, I'm a kid that grew up in that neighbourhood. I'm feeling a bit like I want to find out who I am and where, where did I come from now, where do I belong. I know I don't belong in the street in which I wrote my generation. I wrote my, my generation in the London equivalent of Fifth Avenue. You know, I had a penthouse apartment. Uh, not a penthouse, I had a flat on the top floor. Uh, you know, surrounded by diplomats and millionaires. Uh, I know that I don't belong in the place where I live now. You know, I live in a kind of a leafy suburb in London. That's not where I come from. It's where I live now, but it's not where I come from. And, you know, I come from, I belong, my home and my roots are in a place like White City. But I've, I can't go back. I can't go back. You can never go back once you've left. Mm. And Andrew Wilde, who uh, played Jim in the film, said something very interesting, because he came from a little Yorkshire village. He said that when he goes back to his little Yorkshire village, you know, they, they say, well, it's nice to see you, but they said, what are you doing here? You know, what have you come back for? You know, very suspicious. Uh, so they, this, the difference between me and Jim is that he hasn't run away, and I have. I guess the, probably when you, quote, ran away, you probably thought you were running too, I would guess, and that, that you really were taking a step up. You were taking a stand. You were doing uh, something that you probably admired in yourself and certainly would have admired, admired in, in other people. You were saying, I'm, I'm going to get out of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that's worthwhile. That's, I'm going to make my mark or whatever. Right? Wasn't it a positive? Yeah, you get out of the garbage can and then you find that Into all the, the fun is going on back in the garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> Was, but am I right about that? What, did you think when you yeah, did that? Yeah, I, I think I think I just great. think it's dumb. I, you know, I, it's what uh, is it? What, what I'm getting to is what is it now for the, the perspective of the years that, that makes you be able to look back and go? No, it's seeing both yeah. sides. Seeing both sides. This night ended up a junkie. You know, I might as well have stayed at home and ended up a junkie. Think it wouldn't have happened either way. It was all around you. I don't know. Uh, now, all I, you know, I don't regret anything that I've done. I just would be stupid of me to do so. Uh, neither do I say that what that, that people living in in housing projects like like uh, like White City and others around the world under very adverse circumstances, you know, I that I wouldn't want better for them. I'm not saying that. I'm just the whole point that I'm making in the thing is is that people are seeing things in a different way, and I learned that because I, as somebody who as let's say had had luck and had a few breaks i can see that more clearly than some that perhaps than people that are living there you know on the on the story that i put together on the album steve i talk about the fact that uh that uh jim takes a few of the things that i say 
you know, with a pinch of salt, as we say in Britain. You know, well, that's cool. He can philosophize about it, but you know, I, I actually live it. And uh, so be it. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to uh, change history, particularly. A lot of the things that are coming out from you now, be they the horse's neck or the feature or the LP, seem in many ways to be thinly veiled autobiographies. The guy in the, in the feature is named Pete, and a number of the stories in, in horse's neck, there's a guy called Pete. Is that Pete, this Pete that's sitting in front of me now? Yeah, obviously, you know, I, I, you know, I wrote the stuff. <laughs> My work, yeah, I suppose it is. Yeah. But I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, I don't think White City is as, as autobiographical a piece as as, uh, as Horse's Neck, and the, because it's much more about what I th I believe, whether I'm right or wrong, what I believe is happening now. Uh, not to me, but to other people, and. But White Sit uh, uh, but Horse's Neck, the collection, is, is a kind of a blur of the two. You know, some of the stories where I've used, there's one story called Fish Shop, which is about a kid called Pete, who has a guitar and goes to a, a fish and chip shop and meets a I mean, that didn't happen. You know, just I made that whole thing up. It's lies. If you think it's autobiography, it's lies. No, it's, you know, it's creative work. They, uh, <laughs> I just used the name Pete because I thought it would, it would, allow people to uh, it would enrich the story to some extent if they thought about it as me you know because it was again it, that story that particular story in the book which is the most conventional story is one in which uh, there were so many kids like me you know who wanted to play the guitar and had aspirations and stuff and mm -hmm. And, and I also brought in, I don't know if you noticed in that story, I brought in a bit of Roger's angle, which was that he always felt that had he not made it in a rock band, he would have become a criminal like John McVicker. So, you know, I did bring in the gangs that used to be around. You know, we'd play these pubs and there were these guys kind of come in and start throwing money around in the pub and you'd think, where the hell have they got that? And then you'd find that they'd not robbed a bank, but, you know, they'd robbed a, a, a grocer's store. been really courageous and hit an old lady over the head and stolen her handbag. <laughs> uh, it was a confusing time, you know, uh, and I, I, you know, it's, it is me, it is things that happened mm -hmm. to me, and it is, but it's mostly things I saw. I can, okay. talk about that if you like. When we, Mark, do you want to jump down to near the end in case we really have to uh, take off? Okay. Yes. We've just been told we've got about five minutes. Okay. I want to talk just a tad about, a little more about Horses Neck, if you don't mind. Kaylin? Yep. I'm no, pr pretty okay. sure this is the last thing I'm doing today, so we can go over a little bit. Great. Okay. Uh, you say in, in writing about Horse's Neck that uh, you feel as though you've written an impossible song for the first time. Yeah, yeah. God, I'm good with words. Uh, <laughs> no, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the story, Impossible Song, I actually use lots of little paragraphs which were song ideas. You know, if I have a, an idea, so I scribble down, you know, song about such and such, such and such, and maybe a few. And those were song, those were ideas that I'd never ever been able to make into songs. It's a, it's a, a chapter in the book called Im An Impossible Song. And a lot of the things that I've written in the book, uh, one interesting thing is, is there's one story there, Champagne on the Terraces, which I did turn into a song uh, quite successfully. It was called Somebody Save Me. The song about you know some you know being like really out of uh, out of control and falling in love or an infatuation and 
and not seeing things very, very clearly and letting, and, and, you, you know, and, and yet in the end there's some, some kind of force involved which, which allows you to fall on your feet, if only so that you can fall over again. And, uh, but in, in a lot of cases I did feel like it was something that I couldn't turn, I couldn't deal with in the song form. Uh, although, as you must know, I'm a great believer that the song is, can t carry anything. You know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I've always felt that. I mean, I was at a Dylan party the other day for his 20 years with CBS, so he must have been around for 25 years as a writer. He's proved, surely, if anybody has, that the song can be about anything. You know, we know that songs can be about cars and sex and, and revolution and rebellion and, and all those kind of standard things that rock is associated with, but we now also know that rock can be about the perfume of a flower or, or uh, what was that thing Donovan wrote? Donovan, that guy who's living in the 80s? Mellow Yellow? About the banana peels. Yeah. Well, it was actually about saffron, wasn't it? Uh, the, the, uh, uh, about the peace campaign or about nuclear weapons. It could be right about anything. But I think the complexity of some of the things that I wrote about in Horses Neck, I could only do with prose. I get, get the vibe, and it's, it's kind of fuzzy for me, honestly, but in, in reading some of the things in Horses Neck that, uh, that John Lennon's death shook you up beyond what you would expect. Uh, obviously, it was a loss. You knew him. But beyond that, there was a, a strong identification for you. And it must have changed for you, your relationship with your fans and with the public. Yeah, I, uh... I feel so deeply for, uh, all my friends in, in, in New York, the way that, you know, that, that they felt about John being killed in New York. That feeling of us all being in some way responsible in some peculiar way. But I think the responsibility was felt everywhere from everybody who was involved, everybody who was a fan, everybody who was involved in, 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 in TV, in the record industry, in the star system. Because we know that, you know, it's not particularly healthy. It's not, is it? I mean, there's something about it that isn't quite right, but we still do it, you know, we still build people up and then they get so built up that we we lose them somewhere, you know, over-idealizing people. And, you know, there he is lying on the pavement dead because some crazy guy has lost the plot, you know, and or in the case, I mean, that fantastic story about, about Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. Unbelievable. When I read this, I couldn't believe it. Lee Harvey Oswald's mother got upset because a policeman who was killed at the same time by, by was it by that guy Jack Lee who killed Ruby. Lee? Jack Ruby, Jack Ruby killed, he killed a cop at the same time and the cop's family got compensation, quite rightly. She didn't. She was thinking, hold on a minute, my son's Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, this is just a policeman. She was upset by that. Poor woman, you know, I sympathise with her and all that, I don't want to seem, you know, hard about it. But, uh, nonetheless, you know, it shows how our values have become distorted. And uh, how the value, that you, those values, the kind of sickness that pervades, pervades the minds of people that, that, who become stars through shooting stars. And in the end, I, I saw Yoko and Sean the other day. All I think of when I see them is, is this is a boy, a little boy without a dad, and this is a woman without a husband. You know, f John Lennon is still there, you know, he's still immortalized, his music lives on, and uh, that idealized image of we. And I was angry. I was just angry. I was angry at the star system. And, I, and it was anger, a lot of it, which was pointed at myself because I'd been a part of it and had been complicit in it and, and, uh, and I still, you know, I, you have to just, you have to accept it once, you, once you've hit it, you've got it, you know, and you, nothing you can, you can't. But how has it changed, or has it changed, 
the attitude towards your fans. And with that in mind, as you answer that, uh, I want to talk about the, the book called Starlust that uh, I guess you wrote the introduction for. It hasn't changed my attitude at all, I don't think. I don't blame anybody. I don't blame fans, and I don't feel any differently. I, I uh, no, sort of like a little distance. You don't want to keep any more distance. No fear, no uh, sort of a look askance, perhaps, to, to the people as they come up to you in the street. You know what I'm saying to you. Uh, That's the vibe that I get No, from. because you see, I'm a real man and I'm not afraid of these people. I'm not afraid of getting shot. Come on, shoot me. That will never hit air. That will never hit air. I swear to you on that one. No, really, uh, that, what did you feel as then uh, you read through Starlust and uh, what, why don't you tell us what it is and, and what sort of thoughts? Well, when I, when I read Starlust, which is a collection of, of, uh, of letters sent to the strangest people, you know, I mean, Barry Manilow is the best, he gets the best fan mail. Wish I got fan mail like Barry. <laughs> uh, the, it's how, you know, what strikes me is, is that these letters, and a lot of the letters that I get, although in my case this is just very different, I get a very different, I get two or three different kinds of fan mail. Uh, but the, the, his fan mail has got nothing to do with him whatsoever. You know, he's, he, he's, he's not even in the picture, you know. I mean, he could, w these women are going to be writing these letters. He could walk through the room and out the other side and they wouldn't even notice, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very Okay. Let me know. Speed. Why in, uh, in Horse's Neck, there are thinly veiled stories about Keith, story about Keith. But not, you don't really seem to say Keith. Why not just come right out and say it? Why not make it biographical or autobiographical? Because I didn't want to. Uh, I wanted people to know it was Keith, so I let them know it was Keith. If, if I hadn't want them to know it was Keith, they wouldn't have known. Uh, I wanted them to know it was Keith, but I also wanted them to know that I felt that I was talking about not Keith Moon being missed by Pete Townsend, but a friend being missed by a friend. So think about that, you know. Uh, that's what I wanted to do, you know. That. And uh, so by changing the names and distorting the picture just a wee bit, uh, I just hope that people would realise that that what I was talking about was that feeling that we all have of, of feeling, you know, like the, uh, Remembrance Day the other day and all that, and I've spoken, to, we've, subject of Vietnam comes up, and you talk to the guys who, who fought there, and that feeling of guilt of having survived it, a lot of them, you know. It's a weird feeling, you know. And somebody of your age goes down, and uh, you don't, you survive, and you know, you're glad to survive, but you're not, entirely sure about how it makes you feel and I just wanted to, ch to, to shift the context a wee bit so that people would think about because in the whole thing you know I mean my experience is very very limited and uh, uh, you know I've, I've done what I've done but within the rock and roll world but I do think that the things that I've deduced from it and the feelings that I've had have been straightforward human, human experiences which I can write about like any, any other author uh, most authors uh, can't claim to have had the kind of experience that I've had, but, you know, I haven't been up the Amazon River. I haven't, you know, I haven't done a lot of things that other authors have done. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is that I think there's a value in hoax, you know. Uh, I think it makes you think, you know, there's a, an Argentinian writer called George Dewey Borges who used to write collections of stories which he said were from the Thousand and One Nights. But if you look very closely, the numbers, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so from the Thousand and One Nights, number 323, there weren't that many stories, you know, <laughs> he's just writing new ones. And he was kind of writing in the style. 
And, but the important thing was is that you know that the stories from A Thousand and One Nights are kind of epigrammatic. They've got a, they've always got a, uh, what's the word? Uh, there's a secret hidden there, something uh, li like a moral in every story. And you, so what he was trying to do is he was trying to get you to get in the frame of mind as, ha, ah, this is a story from a thousand, let's look for the moral. But it was uh, something he wanted to tell us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 in odd places I've been, I, in the book, I've certainly been influenced by, I don't say for a minute I can write anything like as well as he can, but I, you know, very, I'm stu I've got one of his books with me right now. I read him all the time. As far as your job at Faber and Faber, what exactly happens there? Do you go in at 9 o'clock in the morning? Do you sit at a desk? Do you go home at 5? Do you go in five days a week? Uh, do, how do they treat you? How do you treat them? Isn't it amazing that because... Uh, we used to smash up guitars, Pete. Because, uh, isn't it amazing that because you, you, uh, you think about book publishing, you automatically think that people have to sit at a desk. Uh, <laughs> book, book publishing, book, book publishing is, 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 uh, is much more connected with moving about, talking to people, traveling, and a lot of the things that I'm quite used to. Uh, I go in for editorial meetings every now and again, once a week. And most of the reading I do at home or in, in my own office, which is in my recording studio. I go to my own office every day, you know. I go in to open mail so that I don't go to jail because I haven't paid my bills. Uh, to read fan mail and stuff like that, you know. I, uh, but I've always done that, you know. I used to do it in between smashing guitars. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, publishing is, is uh, f for the administration staff. They have to go in nine to five, no question about it. But you know, up at Atlantic Records, there are people up there who go in nine to five, five days a week. They're in the music business, mm -hmm. you know. And the same is true of publishing. There are a lot of people that have to be there all the time. I I'm closely allied to the creative side. I'm a commissioning editor. I, I you know, I can go when the hell I like. I think. <laughs> <laughs> who is it? Do we, who is it that we uh, that you're you're working on now? That uh, perhaps that you're reading somebody who you've commissioned that you're excited about. What kinds of projects are you working on now that are? That I are do all kinds of stuff. I don't know whether it be the kind of stuff which uh, which uh, uh, you, you would know about over here. I I I uh, I'm working with an English a young English writer called Robert Elms, who's a his uh, main claim to fame is, is that he's Sade's boyfriend. Do you know who Sade is? He's Sade's boyfriend. Uh, he's a, a writer who grew up with Steve Dagger, who manages Spandau Ballet, went to uh, London School of Economics and came out and he's, he's a, a writer for style magazines like The Face and uh, things like that in Britain. And he's doing a book for me and it's called New Britain, or New British, the New British. And it's about, you know, very much a book about some of the things that I've been saying in White City, but from the point, and, and you know, we, we had a lot of conversations about it, and he's, he's come up with a, his angle on it. Uh, Isn't that what White City was supposed to be? He, uh, the, he, he is, uh, his story is very, very different to mine. But I'm, you say that the, the book is called The New British, and isn't that what, when they built White City, it said it was? The, the, you know, for the new British of a new Britain, yeah. But since it was built in the 1930s, there's a, been another wave of new British. Ah. Uh, this is a book about people that, who are making money in Britain, who have become successful, uh, as distinct from the people who I've portrayed in White City are people who are uh, dealing with life uh, despite the fact that they can't make money, they can't get jobs. So it's a slight difference. But uh, we've enjoyed talking about it. And I, I've done uh, a book recently which is kind of adventurous. It's, it's uh, by 
Brian Eno. It's a collection of his song lyrics and notebooks that he uses to make albums, illustrated by a painter called Russell Mills and put together by a designer. Uh, quite kind of fairly luxury package, but it really throws some new light on Brian Eno's work. Uh, I've done books by an avant-garde English playwright called Stephen Burkoff. He does sort of theatrical versions of Quadrophenia. He's done two street plays, one called West and one called East, about street gangs. And he's, he's, he's never made it in New York yet, because theatre in New York is very conservative, but he's uh, well loved in, New, in, in LA and Israel, Berlin, London. Pretty controversial guy. Done all kinds of interesting stuff. Since I've been with Faber, I've only done about 20 titles, uh, but I only did about 40 titles in my first publishing company, which I, it was called Eel Pie. I started that in 76, and that ran for seven years, and we only did about 40 titles. You know, quality, not quantity. But I, it's not something that I do full-time. What I do do full-time is I contribute to the general direction and atmosphere of the company. You know, my role at Faber is a recognition of the fact that publishing is changing, that people out there in serious publishing uh, realize that, that, uh, that books are changing and that the reasons why people read these days, it's different. Uh, and that there will always be literature and there will always be classic literature, but there's a, another kind of book which is possible, you know, it kind of some, somewhere possibly between magazines and pulp, pop books and, and serious books, you know, like when you, when you go out to buy a book about uh, photography, let's say, that you, 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 you get a book which tells you not just about the t technical aspects of photography, but the really true story about photography. Now those books are very, very tough to produce and very, very, very tough to, uh, to bring through. That's the kind of thing I've been trying to do. We're going to move on to some other projects that I know you're involved with. Uh, Who's Missing is a collection of old Who material. Why do another collection? It would seem in certain ways that you're trying to put the who behind you. And yet, not in a negative sort of way, I don't mean that, but here I am now at Pete Townsend and I'm doing this, I'm doing White City. Well, I, I, I didn't like the Who's last album and it seems not many other people did either. So uh, we, we thought we'd do Who's Missing because it's... Uh, the exact opposite of that record. It's not a recent live album. You want to stop? Yeah, <laughs> Um, why do who's missing? You seem to want to put the who behind, or essentially answer that question. We we'll re-ask it later, but that's where we have to pick up because we can get an answer on that. Okay, are we rolling? We're mm -hmm. rolling. <clears throat> so that's the question. Why do an album like Who's Missing? We uh, officially were on M uh, on MCA, who own all our back catalogue. Uh, we delivered them a, an album called Who's Last, which was a live album, and. Uh, I think between the record company and the group there was a lot of confusion and uh, we all did our best there but I think we came up with a record that the public didn't like. Uh, and so MCA came back to us recently and said, listen, we found a lot of really great tracks in our archive right here in LA. And they sent us a list and they just had some great old stuff which went back uh, a long way, you know, like that's 1964, you know. And uh, I listened to it and I just loved it because it's really, really early stuff. 
and uh, some more recent stuff, but certainly stuff which Who collectors will like. This is a record just for Who collectors. There's no pretense about the fact that it will... So that means it will just sell like 20 million copies or so, you know, so it's just for collectors. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a small, it'll be a small album, I'm sure, but it's, it's, in a sense, from both MCA's point of view and from the Who's point of view, it was, it was to redress the balance that we felt had been lost a bit on Who's last, which... Uh, what was your contribution to it, do you? I wrote the uh, liner notes. I wrote the liner notes. They're very good. I'm such a good writer. No, they are good. I must. <laughs> no, I, I once did. A, I once did a uh, 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 an article, a review of a record called Meaty, Beaty, Big and Bouncy. I did it. Young asked me. Young one asked me to do it for Rolling Stone. So I was reviewing my own, my own record of you know it was a singles. It was it was good to do, and it's like it was like writing liner notes. And I I quite like liner notes. That's why I wrote liner notes on White City. When I get a record, you know, I have to look for all the print, and, and often you get these records that have been designed by designers, you know, and they tell the group, we don't need any words, just my art would be enough. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> just kick them out, and, you know, so you get... if they can't make it on in an art gallery, you know, why should they make it on a record cover? I like information and words. I like not so much information. I, I do, although I do like information. I like uh, words as well as as images on record sleeves. I do think the record sleeve is a great, great place for for new art. You know, so many of record covers these days are just sensational, and. Uh, there's a little bit of jealousy there because I did go through art school and I bummed out, you know. So, uh, but I, I, uh, who, who, who's missing is a good record. It's, uh, it was difficult for us to find out who wrote some of the songs that we used to play because they're old R and B songs, you know. There's one one there on there called Luby Come Back Home, and and I think we only just recently found out who wrote it. We covered it. We had a copy of it at some point. Some, some, the estate of some, you know, black guy's family somewhere is going to get a big royalty check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be crazy enough to ask if there, if, if MCA is going to do some sort of filmic compilation for this. Then, as much as you love promo videos, I wonder. Yeah, there's. Well, we own a hell of a lot of footage because we brought it all together for that film, Kids Are All Right. But, but I don't imagine the, the things that would turn up there because they're such rarities. There's nothing that's specifically, not even a live performance from some cave somewhere that uh, the band might have done that would turn up. It would have to be some sort of edited kind of job from performance. You know, I never ever thought anybody would turn up any more tracks that I hadn't heard before and MCA managed to do it, so maybe somebody will turn up some footage to go with it, I don't know. It's, uh, as Roger always says, never say never. <laughs> do you think the Who will ever tour again? Never say never. <laughs> <laughs> That's something else that, that we have heard about, not a Who tour, but uh, about you working in 1986 with Roger again on record yeah I I uh, I don't know quite how that's gonna work out uh, the last conversation we had we Roger was asking me to write him a stage musical uh, we've had all kinds of crazy ideas I don't think I don't know what I don't quite know what Roger wants to do because uh, when he finished his last album he, he, he said to a few people he said this is the last record I'm ever gonna make and uh, and then when it started to get really good airplay, he was encouraged and was up again. And uh, so who knows? I mean, I don't know. We'll see. But something will happen. Am I, you're anxious to work with him again. I don't know about anxious. Uh, <laughs> it's inevitable. Uh, we're, we're, we're symbiotic. You know, we've, there's that umbilical is still there. Uh, no, I... I I am anxious to work with him because I think that I can write in a way for him which nobody, in a way nobody else can. And uh, it's, it's, it's good to be able to 
do that kind of thing. I think, you know, I, I wouldn't... I, I don't know whether I, I, I would or will actually play on the record yet or whether I'll just write some stuff or whether I might just write some things which Roger might be able to adapt or or whether I might work on a concept piece which might be a record or a stage show. I don't know quite what will happen, you know. I know that the, the machine normally would be to write the song, go and make the album, the adverts will go in the newspaper saying the first t Townsend Daltrey recording collaboration since, where's the video? Uh, are you going on tour? You know, Roger will never say never, I will say never. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we've both got fairly open minds right now. The great thing is, is that we're, we're talking and we're friends and, and there's potential there. I also heard that of the, I think he has five live dates planned here in December and those rumors are flying, Pete. They say that you're going to be there on at least a few of them. No comment. That's a yes to everybody watching. Uh, comment no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, then I'm not, I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm moving house. I, uh... It's out of the question. I do, I'm fed up with doing things for nothing. <laughs> Although I've heard you comment lately about being sick of touring and, and you'll never do it again, never say never, but you said that you would never tour again. But what about the, the new material, the White City material? You have to be excited about it and you have to still enjoy live performance. Yeah, I do, but I, I, I don't enjoy touring. I, you know, the, the, I, I hear, hear a different word. You know, live performance is one thing, but you know, the fact that you do have to, to tour with it. Why not do it? Pink Floyd did? Because I don't know, you know, well firstly, uh, I, I don't know whether that made money, you know, I mean, what, what is that? It's like taking a, taking a, a film out on the road to, to three stadiums or something. Uh, I, I love what, 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 what Roger Waters has achieved uh, and I, I certainly, you know, I enjoyed The Wall tremendously, but I don't I don't particularly feel that that's the kind of thing I want to do. You know, too, too epic. Yeah. Uh, I had heard, though, that you were interested in playing live. I have, I have just recently played live. I did a show in uh, Brixton in London, and uh, that show... This is distracting. Do you want to make your phone call somewhere else? And. She just wants us to know about that and what your schedule's like. That's why she's doing it. We've got just yeah. a couple more. We'll be done. Yeah, at the end of the year thing, then it's live. Okay. So I guess we're not going to see you play live. You just did a live show in London gets you and America doesn't, even on, on one stage. So well, it, uh, I haven't ruled out the possibility of bringing that band to the States. Uh, the only thing that's bothered me a little bit is if I did bring it, I'd probably come to New York and maybe play what Radio City for five days or something. And then I just think, well, what about all those other places, you know? Yeah, it's a torment, you know. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> that will definitely not go on the air. We'll do the cutaway in a minute. No, I... Uh, but the... the the other thing was is that what was so great about it for me, that particular concert, was is that it was risky, it was fresh, it was brief, and, and at that particular time I had no plans to take it any further. Uh, I did just happen to spend $250,000 filming it, and uh, we got a great film of it. So there's that, which which... I can put out. The great thing about it was for me was is that I enjoyed doing it on my terms and the band enjoyed the fact that I enjoyed myself and in the end it seemed that the audience enjoyed it. It was fun and if I went out on tour I think I'd be afraid that although I'm sure once I got on a stage it would be fun that I'd you know I'd be a little bit afraid I think maybe you know that all those old things would happen again. I don't know.
Certainly my family wouldn't prevent me from touring again. I don't think anything would stop me touring except me. And uh, Robert Plant said something similar, although not not as much about touring specifically, but about getting back with his old band again on stage and looking around. It was all those old evils just sort of lurking right around him again. Two things to close. First of all, uh, we've been looking back at MTV over the year, and uh, there's no question that Live Aid was the biggest thing to go on in that spirit. And your involvement there was, was exciting. And I wondered what what went through your mind when you were first approached about Live Aid and who made the phone call to get the Who reunion together and all those fights that we read about here in fact true in fact I read the day of it looked like you guys weren't gonna play no once we'd agreed to play we we there was never any any problem and we agreed to play three weeks before the concert uh, so all the stuff in between that was just just rumors but uh, it did take Gold off a time to convince us uh, he rang me first and he said told me about the concert and said that you know every dollar that was raised would save a life and every two dollars or something that was raised would save a life and and if I appeared <clears throat> you know I could probably add two hundred thousand dollars so that's you know a hundred thousand people i would save and or not save and, if you didn't die. and if if i appeared with roger maybe just for a song or two you know i it would be worth four hundred thousand dollars but better yet if the who would reform he could get a million dollars and so i said listen bob i, I get i get you know i'd love to do it on my own and all that but i'll i'll call him so i had lunch the next day with roger and roger immediately agreed but under certain conditions, which I found unacceptable, and which John found unacceptable. Which were? And uh, I can't tell you. And, uh, and then later on we overcame that problem. And then, uh, and then somebody phoned me up and told me not to do the concert because the funds weren't being properly administered. Uh, and so Paul McCartney and I consulted a guy who had done a lot of work in Ethiopia ten years ago, an English journalist, called, TV journalist called Jonathan Dimbleby. He gave me a list of 20 questions to ask Bob. I sat on the phone. It took Bob about an hour and a half or something to reply to them. And he was delighted to reply. He said, listen, you're the first artist who has actually asked me how we're going to spend the money. I'm pleased to tell you. I passed those back to Dimbleby. Dimbleby said, listen, this is kosher. Go ahead, you know. So there were moments when it was on, off, on, off, on, off, you know, and uh, right to the end. I think the last person was John Entwistle was kind of uneasy about it. He was afraid that if we did it, I don't know, I can't, you know, let him speak. Let him tell his story when he next comes in. I did, you know, he was uneasy about it for some reason. Uh, you know, we were also anxious not to pressurise one another and also sensitive, so sensitive to the way we each felt. And in the end, the thing is show business, man. It might, you know, whether, it, whether it raises money or not, you know, it's, you know, you've got to get up there and you've got to be good because people, we're not, it's not our money we're giving away. We're giving away your money. You paid, you know. We didn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't pay anything. It didn't cost me anything to do Live Aid. Maybe it cost me a... I read somewhere some group saying it cost them $100,000 or something to do Live Aid. I don't, you know, I think it cost the Who nothing. Mm -hmm. When uh, you look back on it, does, does the event itself, be, is the event itself what you remember, or do you remember the hassle of, of getting the band back together to do it, or the excitement of being I just on? remember the event. It was great. It was wonderful. I mean, you know, landmark event, absolutely landmark, you know. I, you know, after Woodstock, I walked out of that thing and I'd little turn around and say, I'm glad to get out of here, the whole thing stinks. You know, I mean, I'm a terrible, terrible cynic. If there was anything bad about it, I'd say so. It was a little bit insipid because the, uh, uh, there wasn't really enough time to get the sound right for various acts and stuff. But, you know, what a, what a, a day for everybody, both for the acts in New York and for London and the link up and, 
you know, the other countries that were involved in it, the feeling of, you know, we were all getting together, we all had our own axes to grind, but maybe some people were doing it for, for to reach a billion people, to sell records, other people maybe really just wanted to feed Ethiopians, maybe a couple of other people were doing it for a mixture of reasons, but in the end, together, we were powerful. And this is what Rock had been promising for 20 years, power for the people. And strange though, in the end, the bitter irony of it all is, is that, you know, the power turns out to be uh, Rock as the people's elected representatives going up on stage and uh, <laughs> giving their money away. <laughs> it's like, you know, like being the, what do they call, what do they call the guy over here who, who, who decides what to tax people and what to spend it on? As a kind of a special senator who looks after, in Britain there's, they, there's they, they call him the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he's the guy who did, you know, I was thinking that Bob Geldof was actually like a sort of a, like Rock's Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, <laughs> uh, we, we, were, we, were, we were taking a cull, we were culling a tax and, and then spending it. No, it was a great day. I loved it. It was great to see so many old friends and for me good because, you know, I've always been very interested in the growth and ev evolution of the business and so it's good to see the new faces mixed with the old faces. For me the high point, strange thing, I'm really not being patronising here at all. It was just, it came like a shot out of the blue. When we went on the stage at the end in Britain, to sing We Are The World or whatever it is, uh, of which I couldn't remember the tune, you know, <laughs> what is it, do they know it's Christmas, I go, you know, but I'm too old for this, so I was thinking, leaning on the piano. I look around and, and, and you know, the first thing I'm thinking, the stage is going to collapse. <laughs> There are too many people on this stage. It's rated for 15 tons. Hold on, that's 554 people at, you know, 150 pounds each. You know, the stage is going to collapse. That's it, Live Aid. It's good. We're all going to die. And, and then I look round, and my daughter is standing next to me. And I think, oh God, she's going to die too. You know. This is, and, and then next to her is my driver. He is on the stage. Later on I said to him, what the hell are you doing going on the stage with David Bowie and Paul McCartney and all these superstars? And he said, well, Gov, he said, I thought, you know, at my first uh, appearance in public, I should have an audience of at least a billion. <laughs> and uh, everybody was on stage, people's families, people's cleaning ladies, everybody. And uh, in my case, it's true. He, and Suddenly, out of all this, and people, the great thing is, in, they, you know, they talk about Tina Turner and Madonna squabbling backstage at Philadelphia. Do you know, um, people were pushing me aside to get to the front. Get out of here, get out of your elbows. <laughs> Whose elbow was that? Was that David Bowie? Was that Paul McCartney? Was that, you know, who's, you know, I'm going to get to the front. Let me get to the front. I'm important. I must be seen, you know. And, uh, you know, in the end, I'm back up against the wall, you know, thinking that the only way I'm going to get in front of that camera is to do what they're doing, you know, kick a few people in the shin. <laughs> And all this is going down. Anyway, suddenly this voice comes out of the air. And I think, what is that? And it was George Michael. He, he, his voice is not just beautiful, it's loud. And it was just fantastic, this sound of his voice. And I went up to him afterwards, I said, listen, your voice is just unbelievable. And he said, oh, thank you very much. You know, I don't think he knew what I was... That to me was, you know, the, the, just the fact that in the end, somebody's voice, some young guy who is from the new, uh, the, the new wave of acts who apparently, everybody tells me they're just in it for the glamour and for the money, whatever, you know, right out there, you know, the, the, just spiritual it was and uh, great. And, just as the end of a perfect day. In fact, the real end of the perfect day was as I drove home through the suburbs of Wembley to where I live, which is in another suburb. Every front room, a party was going on, you know, with the curtains drawn, people dancing and stuff, listening to the radio, which was being satellited in from Philadelphia. And, uh, and we got the TV as well. Just went on, you know, it went on. It was great. I don't want what we've... Okay. 
Teenage. I think everybody is saying it was live, so maybe for you personally. All right. Mm-hmm. Speak. Still thinking. <laughs> I can take a long time to ask the question. As you look back on 1985, what was the most significant thing that happened to you? Well, I suppose apart from apart from Live Aid, uh, it was actually something quite quite subtle. It was. Uh, Suddenly realizing, I realized this in August, I was on holiday and I was sailing and Simon Le Bon was sailing in the same area in Cornwall and he just had that dive and he was around trying to salvage his boat and I was just out on a small boat sailing and he was getting a really good feeling of freedom and everything and I suddenly thought, hey, I used to think that this is what freedom was sailing and now I know that this isn't freedom what freedom is 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 being able to control uh, my life you know uh, doing things you know control things and and then going back and finishing the record and finishing the film and I feel really good at the moment because I feel in control of things you know and uh, it's about the best feeling I've ever had, and I really feel it's helped. It's helped me to get back in the garbage can, <laughs> and feel that this time I'll be okay. You know, it's been three years since the Who were out on the road, and I have led a quite sort of sequestered life, and uh, I've been very, very doubtful about whether or not I can get back in the front line, and I feel happy about it now happy that it won't hurt me. Great. Thanks. I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> All lies. <laughs> now, do, do, we, do you have the, the restaurant video stuff? Well, as irritated as I get with Dave Marsh, he's got a very nice wife. <laughs> so is this, uh, yes, should I be doing anything? Listening to that. No, I, 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 the last, the last Springsteen tour for me was a real, you know, real education, watching how a friend, uh, yeah. just because he didn't... Bad planning on that No, part, out yeah. of their, beyond their imagination. Uh, I, I, I said to, to, to Dave, you know, who's traveling with, uh, with Springsteen and with Barbara on the tour, you know, well, here we are, you know, you know, in the land of, of rock stadiums, you know. How do you feel about your hero now? What's he going to do with his $90 million? Uh, you know, he's going to need a, a fortress to live in. You know, he's going to need security guards and all the rest of it. And, and it's just, it just happens. It happens to you and there's not much you can do about it. These are the first one means of the White City Project, but... Yeah, tell him to, to just wait five more minutes, okay? What were the beginnings of the White City Project? What were the beginnings of the White City Project? That's fine. Um, did the music on the LP and the feature develop separately? And then I want you to do one. Did the music and the LP... The, did the music on the LP and the feature develop together? Because I'm not sure how he answered it. I think he said no. So, say, did the music and the LP develop separately first? Did the music on the LP and in the feature develop separately? Looks good when you do that. Did the music on the LP and the feature develop together? Great. I think that was the way I asked it, if I remember. But I thought he said that's what I thought you wrote, we wrote, but I thought he said no. So, wait, Ray Davies did something similar on that question. Ray Davies has done something similar to that. Uh, why did you choose Richard Lowenstein as a director for the film, for this film? Why did you choose Richard Lowenstein as a director for this? 
What exactly was your involvement in the, in the development of the movie? Obviously, you wrote the script, but the screenplay, and you sort of looked question at, mark screenplay. You know, but the screenplay, and he said, and he sort of jumped in, so the screenplay can happen. <coughs> what was your? What exactly was your involvement in the development okay. of the movie? Obviously, you wrote the script, but you were talking, and he jumped in. Okay. What exactly was your role in the development of the feature? Obviously, you wrote the screenplay, but then... No, obviously, you wrote the script, but the screenplay... Obviously, you wrote the script. Then, yeah. Actually, did I say script or story? Because I think that's what I was thinking. Maybe you wrote... Say story. Obviously, you wrote the story, but the screenplay... Yeah. And he says, I did write the screenplay, too. Mm -hmm. What exactly was your role in the development of the feature? Obviously, you wrote the story. But did you write the screenplay? Did you get involved? You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of times here. To, you've mentioned a couple of times here today a blending of mediums. You called White City a novel. In what way? You've mentioned a couple of times here. Actually, it was me who mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> We've mentioned it. Uh, <clears throat> you've mentioned a couple of times here a blending of mediums. You call White City a novel. In what way is it a novel? Okay, and um, just the, opposite. the idea that you're crossing artistic lines and mediums is interesting. To me, Horse's Neck isn't, isn't a novel, but a kind, of a, a kind of a record, but more like a record. So, Give me the first part. The idea that you're crossing artistic lines and mediums is interesting. To me, Horse's Neck isn't a novel, but okay. more like a record. I'm glad you asked that. The idea that you're crossing artistic lines and blending mediums uh, is interesting to me. The idea that it seems to me that Horse's Neck is, it's not a novel, it's more like an LP. Um, as long as we're here, um, does it bother you that... We'll be done with it, okay, after this. Okay. Um, does it bother you that um, maybe by default you cease making music for your contemporaries. There's a question in there. There's okay. Does it bother you that, by default, you've ceased making music for your contemporaries? Okay. And John, <laughs> can you get a, a two-shot, John, from... Wasting what could be a great art form and just really churning out commercials. I mean, it wasn't as brutal as, as maybe I just made it sound, but he really said, come on, we have, we have the opportunity to do something great. We have the tools to do something wonderful, important, interesting, enlightening. And we, sh we should all be trying to do that. It happens sometimes, but not enough. I'm paraphrasing. Hmm. These paintings that are being made, but it's the, sort of the nature of it, isn't it, that they're promo films. The record yeah. company's going to come up with 40 grand if, if you're lucky. Or mm. for, for. It's been 20 years since The Who released and pop singer.